<laughs> no, but um, yeah, I am Andy Kern, uh, uh, one of the co-pastors at Falls Bible Church in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, and I also serve at Berean Bible Institute with uh, Dr. Nix and Pastor Walgast, who are here this morning. I'm the Dean of Academics there. Um, so it gives you some insight into what I do. Uh, let's open up God's Word this morning uh, to Romans chapter 16. The uh, assignment this morning is to obviously deal with Romans 9 through 16 under the idea of explanation, uh, focusing on what happened to Israel in God's programs and what's God doing today. And we're going to start in Romans 16 in a little bit. Um, I commend you all for being here at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. I wasn't even sure if I was going to make it, uh, <laughs> but appreciate you all being here this morning and uh, giving this time to the Lord and the study of His Word. <clears throat> I'd like to start with this this morning. People often have a hard time with God's plans. And this is because the desires and expectations of people are rarely in line with God's purposes. As we say often, His ways are not our ways. And even a brief survey of biblical history demonstrates this. The people of Noah's day perished in the worldwide flood because of a failure to heed the true knowledge of who God was and His instructions. Then, as you read on in your Bible, you, you come to the events at the Tower of Babel, which I'm sure you remember. The people of Babel were divided because they refused to acknowledge God's instructions and to obey His will. They were separated. Conf their tongues were confused. And you can read on through the Bible, you see many more examples. Another example of mankind failing to accept God's plans and God's ways uh, is the nation of Israel. When they came out of Egypt and they were wandering through the wilderness and God was even in that time blessing them and what they were in turn complaining and, and questioning God's ways and questioning God's method and questioning God's plans in unbelief. And on and on through scripture we read of man's struggle to accept God's way, God's plans. God's will. And I think that's even true in our own lives when we struggle at times to accept God's plans for our lives. How often has maybe something not gone our way and then we are faced with the choice to either feel that God has somehow failed us or to continue to trust that He is still working all things to good and He is still with us through whatever adversity or tribulation we might face. You know, it's no secret that the trials of life and the trials of serving the Lord have even caused many Christians to walk away from God over time because they come to this idea of God has failed me. He's not really as faithful as I was led to believe. And yet what really God is doing in the midst of those times when we struggle and there's tribulation and trials in our life, what He is doing is really He's just simply working out His goodwill toward His children, even though we often fail to understand it. He's actually blessing people in the midst of adversity. It's just that His working is often beyond our understanding. With that in mind, imagine for a moment with me that you are an Israelite living 2,000 years ago. To you and your people, great promises were made by God you were to be part of a great nation, exclusively serving God and representing Him to the world. And you were awaiting a Messiah that would come and fulfill a multitude of prophecies of all kinds of wonderful blessings to you and through you to the world. And then your people rejected that very Messiah. Then your people resisted God's offer of the promised kingdom. And then a little later, you were told that your people are not God's people anymore. I would say we would be disappointed to say the least. And if that happened, if, if we were an Israelite living 2,000 years ago, and we had lived through the coming of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ and the rejection of the apostles' message, and then this guy Paul came perhaps to your town and said, God's turned away from you. That would be a big pill to swallow, wouldn't it? 
And you would be struggling to accept God's ways, be struggling to accept God's plan. And you would wonder what has happened to Israel. And right next to that, you would be wondering, most likely, is God still faithful? And this is really our topic for this morning, what we want to address. Paul's answer to those questions, what happened to Israel? Is God still faithful in answering that question? And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take an overarching view of Romans 9 through 16 to see what God's explanation is for what happened to the chosen nation Israel and even what he wants to accomplish today in his people, his new people, the body of Christ. But as we do that, as we look at several verses and we go and we kind of skip through some of these chapters, I hope that we also see a truth interwoven in these chapters that God never fails. God never fails. Instead, he is blessing even when it may be beyond our comprehension. And as we walk through these chapters, just three main points. Maybe you can remember these this morning. If you can remember these three main points, you, you pretty much have the sum of it and even what the message is in these chapters. A secret message revealed, a chosen nation set aside, and the new people of God transformed. And that's what we'll be looking at this morning. And I asked you earlier to turn to Romans chapter 16. In any good book, you go right to the end, right? You see how it ends? <laughs> Romans chapter 16, we're going to look at the very last three verses, chapter, or verses 25 through 27. And what Paul, how he concludes this book, Romans 16, 25, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now has been made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures have been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And I turn to this portion first at the end of Romans because I think it kind of sums up what we're wanting to get across this morning. And I want to show us a few things out of these verses, especially verse 25. First of all, Paul talks there about, uh, he uses the phrase, my gospel, right? My gospel. And what that tells us here is that there's a new apostle. There's a new apostle here. Here is a message that, that God is revealing. It says that the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. And literally, if you went back to Greek and, and defined the words literally, it, just, it, it means making known the secret that God had kept silent since the world began. Making known the secret that God had kept silent since the world began. And he made it known to this guy, Paul, right? We understand that. But this verse is very clear. He calls it my gospel. It wasn't any, anybody else's message. It was his message alone. So we see a new apostle here. And we have to understand that if we're going to understand the overarching themes of Romans, that this Paul was given a, a message to deliver to the people, the people in the whole world. And here it's very clear that God wants people today to be established upon this message, this good news about Jesus that was a secret that God had kept silent until Paul came along. So we see a new apostle. We also see here, uh, we could use the same, uh, the same phrase, my gospel, we see a new gospel. This message was new. It wasn't the same old message given to a new guy. It was a new message. Again, these are things you understand, I know. But we see here a new gospel. What does that mean? What is this good news about Jesus that had been a secret until Paul uh, was told about it? There's lots of things we could bring into this. Uh, one of the elements of this is the gospel of salvation. How do, you, how do you come to know Jesus today? How do you come to God the Father today? And we know that it's simply by believing in Jesus Christ that he died for you, was buried, and rose again the third day. It's by f grace alone. Uh, it's by faith alone in Christ alone. That's the good news about how you get saved. And Paul was given that gospel. Some of the other things that go along with this new gospel, this new body of truth, is that Gentiles now receive the indwelling Holy Spirit when they believe. They're given the Holy Spirit. He comes and resides in us and lives there. 
and works in our heart to transform us, to conform us to the image of Christ. And, and there's places in Paul's epistles where he talks about all these spiritual blessings we've been given now in Jesus Christ. Another element of this new gospel, this new body of truth, is that believers today are not appointed to wrath. But we have this very special hope that before God brings about the seven-year tribulation time, before He pours out His wrath on the world, which is very much deserved, before He does that, He is going to take us out of here. He is going to rapture the church. He is going to remove us from the world, take us to heaven to live with Christ forever, and that is our hope. Only Paul was given that message about the rapture and that truth. So we have a new apostle with a new gospel. And as a byproduct of that, you have a new people. A new people. And in Romans 16, 26, as Paul is talking about how this has been the secret plan of God had been made known, he talks about um, it's being made known to all nations. You know, as you read through the Bible, just about every message God ever gave was directed to Israel, to that nation, part of their promises and covenants and so forth. But now we have a new guy with a, a new gospel, and he says it's for everybody. And that, that gives us the idea there's a new people. Anyone can come. Anyone can take advantage of this new opportunity. And so we have to understand this, that there, when you read through Romans, there's been a secret message revealed. And things have changed. And even the things that uh, Pastor uh, Kevin was talking about last night with justification, that's all part of this new message. And those are the truths that Paul's explaining in the book of Romans, these new ideas. But even though we have a new apostle and a new gospel and a new people, we still have old misunderstandings. <laughs> old misunderstandings. People are still struggling with God's plan for today. Many fail to see that God's plan for national Israel and the church today are different. Some just don't get it. Some willfully reject it. And they just say no. Either way, trouble will result. Are you familiar with the term covenant theology? It's a pretty broad term. It, 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 a lot of people could come under that label, um, many denominations and so forth. But covenant theology, just in general basically believes that God has replaced Israel with the church. Essentially that the church today is new Israel. National Israel is forever gone. The church today has taken over and is, is a new Israel. And what that does, uh, when you, when you want to hold to that idea, the results, then you have to go back to places like the Old Testament and you have to take all these promises and prophecies about Israel and you have to somehow try to make them conform to the church today. And you, a lot of times to do that, you have to allegorize or spiritualize them. You have to make them mean something else than what they actually say. And a lot of trouble has come uh, through those kinds of uh, positions and so forth. We also know a lot about Acts 2 theology. Uh, you know, there's other dispensationalists out there besides you and I. Uh, who are mid-Acts dispensational. There's a lot of dispensationalists out there, but a lot see the church beginning in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, right? Mm -hmm. And when you take that position, when you see the church beginning at Pentecost, what you tend to do is then you, can, you tend to take what Jesus taught on the earth and the Gospels, and you try to make that conform to the church today. And Pastor Kevin was actually talking about that Sunday morning and with the idea of prayer and how we pray today and how things have, have changed. And so... Either way, whether it's covenant theology or X2 theology, what happens is we start taking promises that are not directed to us personally as the body of Christ. And that brings in a lot of problems. Because what's it going to do when, when, you, when you can't clearly see what God's doing today is that your idea of the truth will be askewed. And you'll be trying to apply things and, 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 and do things in the Bible that aren't for you. And when you do that, when you, when you, anytime you're outside of truth, you're going to set, your, set yourself up for failure and disappointment. And it's, and it's going to be a hard go. And then what the tendency is going to be is when I, when I fail, my tendency is going to start being, what's wrong with you, God? Why didn't you keep your promise? Why didn't you do this in my life? I thought that you were, if I did this, you were going to do that. When we set ourselves up for failure, when we get away with the truth, the tendency then is to think God has failed, failed you. 
And then we start questioning God's goodness, God's faithfulness, and all those kinds of things come as a byproduct, as a result of that. And that's really why we have to understand these things. You know, I can remember back when I was saved at the age of 14, I was fortunate enough to be saved in the context of a church that, that held to these truths, that understood a new message given to Paul and what that meant for us today and understood the grace of God and how salvation was by grace through faith in Christ. And so, and I accepted that at the age of 14 and believed in Christ. And I remember not long after, you know, talking to different ones, family, friends, and I remember having a conversation with one of my grandmothers and just telling her about, you know, how I got saved and, and, and she brought in, you know, the idea of were you water baptized? Because she was convinced that apart from water baptism, you could not be saved. You could not be saved apart. If you're not saved, you're not, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. And there's a, where I grew up, there's, there's several churches in, that hold that kind of a view. And I remember um, another testimony, if you will, um, a friend of mine, a next door neighbor whose friend growing up with him, went to church with him sometimes. It was kind of a Pentecostal church. And he was convinced, I remember talking to him, and he didn't think I could be saved because he was convinced that you had to go to his church and go up to the altar to be saved. And if you didn't go up there and make that public confession at the altar, you were not saved. There's just no way. And I just use those as illustrations. Those are very serious misunderstandings, aren't they? Because you're keeping people away from Jesus Christ. You're putting up these things that people stumble over in trying to get to Jesus. But I just bring those up to show how we can set ourselves up for failure when you hold to these things. If somebody is believing that God's still granting people, for, for example, the miraculous gift of healing, what are they really doing? They're just setting themselves up and others for failure. And then the next step is going to be to question God. And then they're going to be hardened against God. And so we come to Romans 16, we read this passage first so that we all understand about this secret message being revealed and what it involves. New apostle, new gospel, new people. The blessings of justification, the blessings of sanctification, the blessings of our heavenly hope, and all these things. And we're going to hear a lot about these things this week as we walk through uh, all of Paul's epistles. But Paul is, again, he's declaring a lot of these things in the book of Romans. And as he's declaring all these wonderful truths that are now to all people, Jew, Gentile alike, there's no difference. There's going to be questions that come up. And as I started with, that idea that if you were an Israelite, and you were hearing these things, you would be wondering, what is God up to? What is he doing? What about everything he promised to my people? So in declaring God's plans and blessings for the body of Christ, the question arises, what happened to Israel and the promises to that nation? And as we're going to move to our second point, the chosen nation set aside, we're going to go to chapter 9 of Romans now and pick it up here. And you can open to the Romans chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, and we'll read those in just a minute. Romans 9, beginning with verse 4. But here in Romans 9 through 11, Paul is basically explaining what happened to Israel. Uh, he's dealing with Israel's past, present, and even their future. He's gonna, he explains why they failed why they're unbelieving today or what they're doing today. And he's going to even explain what God's still got planned for them in the future in these chapters. And again, we don't have time to go through all these chapters. Uh, it's kind of a, the blessing in disguise of having to you know, go through the second half of Romans in 40 minutes. Is, is there anything in here that I don't quite understand or it's too hard? We just don't have time for that. <laughs> we just skip right over. We don't have time for that. <clears throat> but in Romans 9 through 11, he's dealing with Israel, answering this question. And he's also actually addressing a charge that some would raise against God. Is, isn't God unrighteous to set Israel aside? Isn't he being unfaithful and breaking promises and, and that kind of a thing? And, and obviously Israelites hearing Paul's message would be tempted to question God. And he's explaining, oh, no, that's not the case at all. Uh, God is completely righteous even in what he's doing. So the chosen nation is set aside here in Romans 9 through 11. I'm just going to give you kind of a summary point of each of these three chapters, and then we'll talk about a few things, and, and then we'll have to move on. But first of all, with chapter 9 here, to me the idea of chapter 9, Romans, is that Israel is hardened, but God has a purpose in that hardening. Israel is hardened, but God has a purpose in that. And as we think back of Israel's history, 
and, and all the blessings they had. See, Israel was to be a light to the world, to reach the world, to take the knowledge of the Lord God Almighty out to the Gentiles and to make God known to the world. But the story of Israel is blessings of God met with unbelief. Blessings of God met with unbelief. That's really the story as you read through the Old Testament. If you look in chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, Paul is fully aware of the promises God made to Israel. And he's talking about Israel. He's talking about how much he desires to see the Israelites come to Christ, to believe in Christ and be saved. But he recognizes that the majority of that nation has hardened their hearts against God and rejected God's offer of Christ. But in Romans 9, 4, he writes, Who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. And here he just quickly highlights these promises that God made to Israel. He talks about the adoption. Israel was God's firstborn. They're his chosen people to go out to the world. They are his sons. And he says they had the glory. They actually had the presence of God dwelling amongst them in their nation. It was actually the presence of the glory of God that led them out of Egypt and then resided in the tabernacle and then later resided in the temple. They actually could see the literal bright glory of God. And he says they had the covenants. They had these promises that were made to Abraham and, and, and Moses and the promise of the new covenant even that came through the prophets later. And he talks about the giving of the law, the five books of Moses. Uh, we call it the Torah sometimes. But the, the, the things that God laid out through Moses, all for Israel's sake, all for Israel's uh, privileges and their responsibility and them reaching the nation. And he talks about the service of God. Probably he's talking about their priesthood. They were to be a nation of priests. And they had a priesthood within their nation with the Levites and the sons of Aaron and so forth. And he said, talks again about, he says, the promises the promises, the prophecies about Israel's future and the blessings that would come through them. And he talks about the fathers in verse 5, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. No other nation had any of these things. No other nation was made such promises and given the glory of God and could see these same things. And the last thing he mentions in verse 5 is that how through Israel, Christ was to come. They were the ones that were to bring the Messiah into the world. They had all these privileges. They had all these advantages. And yet, they did not succeed. They did not succeed. And why did they not succeed? Well, the answer is even given in Romans chapter 9. And just turn a little bit later, Romans chapter 9, and let's start with verse 30 and read a few verses here. Romans 9, verse 30. He says, what shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Obviously, the rock is Jesus Christ. They failed in unbelief. That's where failure always comes from, unbelief toward God. And they failed to understand what was really at the heart of all that stuff God had given them. At the heart of all that, there was always the necessity of faith, trusting God, believing God, even having a relationship with God. But what had happened in Israel is probably what would be all of our tendency with so many external blessings and so many physical blessings, you get kind of caught up and focused on all that external stuff and you don't really deal with your heart. And you start to think that God should work according to my plans and purposes and expectations. And that's what happened. They were trying to make themselves righteous through the law. They were trying to do things their own way and they failed in unbelief. And so that's what Paul explains here in chapters 9 and partly in chapter 10. They didn't succeed because they didn't really believe. And that's why when you read in the Old Testament, the history of Israel is this roller coaster, right? That would, the Old Testament would make a great soap opera, right? I mean, it's exactly what it is, up and down. And, and uh, you know, just one thing after another, on and on it goes. But in all that, you never find Israel fulfilling their God-given mission to bring salvation to the world. It never happened. 
because of unbelief. Instead, there was always the need to bring in judgments and so forth. And then when Christ came, they also rejected him. So they hardened themselves. They were unbelieving. They were blinded. But what Paul's bringing out here in chapter 9 is that even though Israel is hardened and blinded and unbelieving, God had a secret plan. God had a plan for all of this. He had accounted for it already. And he used this hardening of Israel as an opportunity. So there's a secret purpose in Israel's hardening. And uh, that's what he brings out here in chapter 9. And he actually tells it, he uses several different examples in chapter 9 to bring this out. But he uses the idea of Pharaoh. And he talks about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And if you were to go back and read through the book of Exodus, you would read this. When, when God wanted to bring his people out of Egypt, he sent in Moses and Aaron. And they were, the message was, let my people go so they can go out and sacrifice to God and, and go on their way. And Pharaoh said, no. No, and so then this sequence of plagues began, right? The frogs, the lice, the pestilence, and on it goes. And, and the plague would come, and it would be a huge burden on the Egyptians, and Pharaoh would kind of seem like he would break down a little bit and say, okay, pray to God this goes away, I'll let, you, I'll let your people go. Moses would go pray, the plague would cease, and then Pharaoh would say, you know, I changed my mind, you can't go. And his he, and he heart just got harder and harder and harder through that sequence. Even though he could see all these great signs and, and, and even others next to him were, being, were changing their minds about the God of Israel and saying, you ought to let these people go. That's what they were saying by the end. You should just let them go. And he said, no, no, no. And it shows you what a heart can do. Even when confronted with God, it can get hard and just keep saying no to God. But Paul, he uses the example of Pharaoh to show that even when somebody gets hard in unbelief, God can still use it. And it says there in Romans 9 that the purpose of that was so God could show his power to the world. He knew Pharaoh would respond such a way, and he used it to show his glory, and he still brought Israel out. He still accomplished his will. So just like kind of what Paul is saying there then is, just like God once used a hardened Gentile to bring blessing and deliverance upon Israel, now what he's doing is he's using a hardened Israel as an opportunity to bring salvation and blessing upon Gentiles. And he uses that as kind of inverted example, if you will. But it just shows that this, that even though Israel is hardened, God had a secret purpose for it. And we got to see that it wasn't, God wasn't unfaithful, God wasn't failing. God had another purpose that was yet to be revealed. And he had already accounted for all this. But I'll say this before we move on. Israel is a testimony about what happens to a people when they cannot accept God's plans for their lives. They become hardened and rebellious. And we need to be on guard against such an attitude in our lives when our plans don't line up with God's plans. So in chapter 10, the main point here is that Israel is unbelieving, but God still saves. And what Paul does in chapter 10 is just show that Israel has, has been given opportunity. Preachers have gone out. They, they know about Christ. They've heard about Christ. Paul had carried the message fairly far and wide by this point. Israel was hearing about Christ, but still saying no to him. They said no to him under the kingdom program, and they were still saying no to him under grace. They were, still, they were resisting God's plans for today. But even though Israel wouldn't believe, God was still saving people. God's still saving everybody. And just look at Romans 10 and verse... Now, 12 and 13. Let's just look at these two verses here. This just shows us the opportunity for all people to be saved. In my mind, Romans 10 really shows that God wants all people to be saved. And Romans 9, or excuse me, 10, 12 and 13 says, For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The call goes out to everyone. Everybody can be saved. I think Paul wholeheartedly believed that this nation of people who in the majority were hardened against God and rebelling and, and, and not wanting to believe in Christ, there was still hope for them even. Even those who shake their fist at God, God can still save them. And there's something we can take away from that because we probably have people in our life who we may sometimes be tempted to believe they're beyond saving. <laughs> and that maybe you've heard people curse God and hate on God and you just can't see how they could ever be saved. But, but God is able. But it comes down to the person's heart. Will they open their heart to God? And what Paul's showing in chapter 10 is that Israel would not 
He, they would not open their heart to God. Even though he was stretching out his hands to them, but they were, they were saying no to him. So Israel was unbelieving, but God was still saving. And then you come to chapter 11, and Paul deals with Israel's future. And the lesson here is, God is faithful, and he will restore Israel. He is going to bring it all back together in the future. He is going to restore this nation, bless them, use them to reach the world. It's just that it's not happening today. And I'll just tell you this, you know, Romans 9 through 11, uh, these are battle, battleground chapters. You know, you've heard in elections, they talk about battleground states and the politicians go there and really, really, really campaign. You know, they put all their money and time in those certain states. Well, these chapters, a lot of theologians do that. They come to Romans 9, 10, 11, and they really, really campaign for, you know, different doctrines and, and things, you know, and there's all kinds of debates out there, like with sovereignty and election and different things like that, and covenant theology and dispensational theology, especially with chapter 11, because basically their debate is, is there a future for national Israel? Is there a future for national Israel? And I think the, the, whole, the, the answer that Paul gives is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes, there's a future for Israel. And Paul explains that, but let's just look at a couple of verses in chapter 11. Let's look at verse 29. Chapter 11, verse 29. We saw a little bit ago in Romans chapter 9, the privileges of Israel, the blessings, the covenants, the glory, all those things, right? That was the calling and the gifts for Israel. And in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, Paul is explaining that indeed there is a future for Israel. Yes, they're blinded today, and God's using that as an opportunity to reach Gentiles and Jews if they would believe. But he still has a, he still has a future for national Israel. And in chapter 11, verse 29, it says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So Paul does answer what happened to Israel, and he also adds what will happen to Israel. And he answers the question whether or not God is faithful. And the, the resounding answer is, yes, he's faithful. Yes, he will keep his promises. But don't question his methods today, because in his methods... When it looked like there was no hope for the world because Israel had fallen, Israel was hard, Israel was rebellious, when it looked like there was no hope, God had another way. God is still faithful. God had a plan. And that's why when you come to the end of chapter 11, Paul is excited about the wisdom of God. The theme of the conference is the manifold wisdom of God. And he's excited about the wisdom of God in Romans 11. And just look at these verses briefly with me. Verse 33 Notice his, his exuberance, his enthusiasm, his excitement here. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has first, uh, who, excuse me, or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. This is what Israel's hardening and God's secret plan, this is what it meant for the apostle. He said, don't question God. Don't you become hard because you don't understand what God's doing. Because he's still working. And his wisdom and his judgment and his ways are past finding out. So dispensationally, we understand what happened to Israel and what God's doing today. And again, we ought to take away the application, even in our own personal lives. If we don't know what God's doing in my life or your life, don't question his wisdom. Don't question his judgments. Don't stop believing that he is good and that he is able to see you through difficult days. He is a powerful and awesome God and Paul was convinced of that. But in hearing about Israel's failure, God's mercy, the question then becomes for you and I, hearing these things and knowing these things, what is our response to what God is doing today? What is you and I response to God's purpose for us? And as you go through chapter 12 through 16 of Romans, you, you see what this purpose is, really. And Paul here, he envisions a new people of God transformed to serve the Lord, who walk in faith, who are not hardened in unbelief like the national Israel, but with soft hearts following the direction of the Lord, who serve God, who love the Lord and love people. That's the kind of people God is making today. And if you look in Romans chapter 12, just to get a sense of this, Verses 1 and 2, often quoted and memorized verses. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And all that, all that Paul unfolds in Romans 1 through 8 about justification and the, the life we have in Christ and everything he explains about Israel's hardening and God's secret purpose and that, he says, it ought to change your heart. It ought to soften your heart to God. You ought to be saying, God, what's your will for my life? Just teach me, show me, let me follow you, transform me. That was Paul's response, and he would hope it would be our response as well. And as you go through chapters 12 through 16, you see what I would call the marks of the transformed life. I'm just going to read some to you. As he goes through this, he talks about the believers using their gifts for God in chapter 12. He talks about believers showing good to all people at the end of chapter 12. He talks about submitting to authority in chapter 13. Trust God and pay your taxes. <laughs> That's a testimony for the Lord. God uses that. As he goes on, chapter 13, he talks about loving people like Christ. When you get into chapters 14 and 15, he talks about being united in Christ, working through your cultural differences or your preferences, putting people above your preferences and receiving and accepting one another in love. And then as he gets kind of to the midpoint of chapter 15, he, talk, he starts talking about all these reasons that the Gentiles should be rejoicing and glorifying Jesus Christ, glorifying Jesus Christ, as he talks about the Gentiles praising Christ there. And one of my favorite verses in Romans is Romans 15, 13, and I'll just read it to you. It says this, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, that's what God has for you today. I don't know what you're going through today. You don't know what I'm going through today. But the promise to the body of Christ today is if you're trusting God, whatever situation you're in, joy and peace is available. Just by trusting God. Joy and peace is available. Not when your circumstances change. Not when God blesses you the way you expect Him to bless you. He says right now, no matter what you're facing, if you're trusting God, joy and peace is available. And we have that hope in Christ. So Paul, all these things in Romans 15 through 16 about what it looks like when your life becomes transformed, when it becomes Christ-like. But what's the point of all that? What's the point of all that transformation? Well, we'll briefly go back to Romans 16, verses 25 through 27. We'll bring it full cycle to show you how this cycle should continue. That when your life is being transformed by Jesus Christ, you're not only given the message, but now you're living the message of grace for today. And when your life is transformed, people see that. Think of that verse we just read in Romans 15, peace and joy. When adversity comes, if you're, if you're living there and people see that, that's going to draw their attention. They're going to be like, what do you got that I don't got? And it draws people in. The transformed life has a result. It has a purpose. And it gives you the opportunity to take the gospel of grace into the world further. Romans 16, 25 through 27, we started with that. But Paul was talking about this secret being made known to all nations, to the world. The, the secret's been revealed, but the knowledge of that is still going out today, right? There's still people who don't know, still people who don't know Jesus Christ. And they need to know Him. And God has given us that privilege to take that knowledge out. And thus he calls us to have a life that reflects the truth of the gospel today, that reflects that power of God in our lives. It gives us a testimony that cannot be ignored. Even think of Paul's life. He hated Christ. He hated people who followed Christ. He was hard. He was blind. He was rebellious. God saved him. God converted him, and it transformed his life. And he went from persecutor to preacher. And he, everywhere he went, he couldn't help but tell people how great God was. And tell them about Jesus Christ. Tell them what God was doing today. You know, in my own personal life, what got my attention was people who cared. I mean, you can preach all day long, and it may be true. And the Holy Spirit's going to work and convict hearts, don't get me wrong. But what got my attention was I came across some people who cared about me who had no reason to, really. They cared about me. Grace had transformed their life. Jesus Christ was real and living in them. Amen. 
And that got my attention. Snooze. <laughs> I'll close with this. I said it to start. People have a hard time with God's plans. But when you and I trust God, and whatever circumstances we face, our life makes a statement. We show that God is faithful. Because we're living it out. We show that God is faithful. When we let Him transform us by the renewing of our mind, we're showing that God is powerful to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think in my life. When we choose to love a person and show kindness, we're showing that God is loving and good. When we live out this Christ-like character that Paul spent so much time writing about, you and I can be used of God to help people trust God today, to, to know His plans, and to trust in Jesus Christ. And that's what God gives us. And um, I trust we all take that to heart. And I guess just close with this. Let's just keep walking by faith in what God has shown us. So let's pray. Father, thanks for our time and for all these dear ones being out this morning. And uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, we take something away of just, if nothing else, just being on guard on our own hearts and our own struggles, Lord, and just the challenge to continue to trust you, uh, to never doubt your goodness, to never ever even be tempted to believe that you failed us, but to know that you are faithful, Lord, and you have a purpose even in our sufferings and our trials. So, Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Keep us faithful. Uh, keep us walking with you and trusting you and being an ambassador for Jesus Christ today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.